So yes, good morning or good evening to um, our German uh, colleague, Michael, who we'll be hearing from shortly. Uh, so thank you everyone for uh, coming in person or dialing in online uh, via webinar to learn a bit about uh, more about photoelectrochemistry instrumentation and specifically some of the uh, products that my company, Admiral Instruments, sells in partnership with uh, Donner Scientific Instruments, which is based in Germany. Uh, in, uh, you can see on the screen here, okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, so you can see on the screen here, the title slide, this is uh, going to be the focus of our uh, of our attention for today. Uh, this uh, workstation here is the uh, Zoner SIMS system. We'll learn what SIMS means uh, shortly. Uh, but this is an all-in-one electrochemistry workstation that uh, can do a lot that is relevant for solar cell research, which is, of course, the main thrust and request uh, uh, partnership among ASU and other universities. So for today, uh, I will but before we get into the, uh, the bulk of the presentation, which will involve some real hands-on experiments from Michael, I'll just be spending a few minutes setting the stage, giving an overview about Admiral Instruments, uh, go over uh, some of the fundamental uh, measurements that are relevant for solar cell research, among uh, other photoelectrochemistry applications, and we'll spend uh, some time explaining what you see uh, in front of me here uh, in person, as well as on the title slide, as well as the instrumentation that Michael has in Germany that he'll be demonstrating for us. And then Michael will be uh, the one running uh, some of these commonly used measurements you see here uh, listed on the slide. So Admiral Instruments is a, uh, a new company in the, in the electrochemistry instrumentation space that of course includes photoelectrochemistry. We consider ourselves to be the new kids on the block uh, in terms of building um, low cost, easy to use, potentially stats and related workstations for all sorts of application areas, solar being one of those focus areas. Uh, so we do have this two distinct product lines. Our squid stats and potentially stats are uh, products that we build here in the US and uh, are um, best suited for um, relatively simple measurements to low one amp uh, that uh, you know you don't necessarily need very high instrumentation. You need to spend ten thousand dollars. We have products for uh, starting as well as nineteen hundred dollars, um, and have EIS capable instruments for under five thousand dollars. Now, in addition to our squid stat potential stats, Admiral Instruments is the exclusive distributor for um, all of Zahner's uh, products uh, that are photoelectrochemistry and electrochemistry related. Uh, these are uh, um, they're the main class of instrumentation are called the Zenium workstations and that uh, you can see some of those here in front of me. These are very high instruments that have advanced circuit modeling capabilities and multi-sign EIS functionality. Um, and parallel EIS, lots and lots of different features uh, for people that want best-in-class instrumentation for their measurements. Zahn has been around for over 40 years, uh, customers all around the world were definitely um, honored to be able to work with them uh, and represent them here in the United States. <clears throat> so when uh, talking about photoelectrochemistry, and fundamentally what the whole purpose of uh, collecting data is, especially as it relates to solar PV, uh, just for anyone that, you know, wants to discuss that we're basically seeking to look at the dynamic transfer function between photovoltaic and current. And so that, of course, is very relevant for solar cell research to understand as a function of wavelength, just uh, how well uh, your cell um, uh, is converting into a charge carrier. So the top two measurements that are most commonly utilized are intensity modulated photocurrent spectroscopy and intensity mod modulated photovoltaic spectroscopy. So there's plenty of instrumentation out there that takes those types of measurements, um, but there are some special 
things that need to be considered when you are, especially as it relates to the light source, to ensure that you are getting a reliable input and actively measuring the output of the system being tested. Uh, and so then the other uh, typically used uh, measurement technique is incident photon to charge your, your efficiency, um, also known as quantum efficiency. And uh, that's a ratio between the number of photons that are incident, you know, that are, are uh, on your solar cell and then how, what the ratio is of those that are actually turned into charge carriers. And you test that different wavelengths or even modulate it back and forth between them to see just how well your system is performing. And uh, so this is a summary of uh, other functions, including the ones I just mentioned and all the mathematical relationships that uh, are involved. Um, all of these being relevant for understanding just how a solar cell is functioning. So, his honor, uh, if you look in literature, you'll see that there are a number of, uh, of uh, research institutions that use honor for rather specific reasons. And much of this is related to the light source and quality of the light source. So, you notice that. Uh, the name for the source station is since the IMPS. Well, we, we talked about IMPS, so what's the C there for? Well, the C is basically to represent the special control capabilities that uh, is on, built in to the light source to ensure that you are indeed getting a accurate and consistent and, and linear and, uh, and stable uh, light source that is at the right intensity that you set it at. So the way that works is there's an active feedback control loop uh, that you can all incorporate with this sensor right here. This is uh, the fundamental uh, way in which we are able to measure the light source intensity as well as um, being able to then have this a light source feedback with the power supply here that's actually controlling the light source and powering it. So you're able to constantly be looking at the intensity and modulation, regulating it accordingly to make sure that um, if your light source is, for example, heating up, which might affect the calibration of it, or if the light source is aging, if you use it, it also can affect the calibration. Um, or even just other nonlinearity that might be involved in the factory calibration itself. By having this active feedback capability, you're uh, correcting for all of that to make sure that no matter what might be happening with your light source, as long as you have that sensor element there um, and giving that feedback loop and adjusting accordingly, you won't have any problems with having a high quality input signal uh, in terms of your, your opaque length and phase. <coughs> And in addition to this light source um, feedback control capability, uh, these SIM systems are easily expandable with a variety of different accessories. Uh, there's a tunable light source there. You can put in third-party spectrophotometers. Uh, you can have um, uh, a solar simulator, lots of different uh, extra applications, which we won't be covering here today, but we can talk about more. Uh, after the fact for anyone interested. Um, so the tunable light source in particular is quite interesting and powerful in that uh, you're able to, uh, this is a product patented by Zoner, and uh, it has a series of dedicated LEDs. I don't have one here to show you, but it's just basically a box with a series of LEDs inside and a linear monochrometer. And so depending anywhere from 295 to 1020 nanometers uh, for your wavelength, you're able to select with a very um, high degree of accuracy, low spectral half width, um, and also high light intensity as compared to using, for example, a xenon lamp, where you have this very bright white light source, very hot, takes time to turn it on, you know, the warm up time, um, and having a monochrometer filtering up so much of the extraneous wavelengths that by the time you get to the one you want, you really can't get a particularly high intensity. 
with the, with the LEDs and the tunable light source, that's not an issue. And also with the tunable light source, if you are going to be uh, wanting to sweep through a variety of wavelengths or, uh, you know, having a, a pulse. So xenon lamps, you have a chopper, but that's not really a truly sinusoidal type of behavior. Both this tunable light source, you're able to have real sine wave modulation. Um, and so that eliminates any harmonic distortion that might come from this chopper that's you know, basically blocking the light. Uh, so now it's time to turn it over to Michael, who uh, again is kind enough to join us uh, from Germany and the evening time there. And he will be uh, giving us example uh, experiments for all of these different measurement techniques that you want to see on the screen here. So. And with that, Michael, I will be handing it to you. So if you could please just uh, share your screen so we can see you as well as uh, um, your screen when you're running the experiments. Okay, so thank you very much for the nice introduction. So I will really present, uh, oh, I probably have to switch over the video. Do I have to? So we can see you. Is it fine? Okay, great. So you can can see my uh, face and probably when I switch to the uh, screen, you will also see my computer screen. Um, at first, I'd like to give a short presentation of the hardware itself. So you see the CIMPS system standing here on the desk and I put the optical bench just in front of it. And one thing we can uh, see is here this plug-in light sources. So you see, I can just remove this one, take it out, get some other one, and just uh, plug it in. So that's a very versatile system. And what I'm presenting at the moment, that's the standard CIMPS system. I will talk about the tunable light source later on. But at the moment, we'll fix um, our experiments to this standard CIMPS, and we've seen this light source is supplemented by this feedback sensor here. And um, as already expressed, that's a really unique feature of Asana, having this small feedback sensor controlling intensity of the light source, actively regulating this. And um, I will now um, switch over to my uh, screen. Okay, so you probably should see uh, the Thales window here. Yes. And uh, we will deal with all this photoelectrochemistry, all this solar energy tasks here. So I switch over to this solar energy um, applications. And the first thing we want to see um, that's um, CIMPS, the standard um, system. And uh, if you've got a look at the software interface, which is coming up here, so it takes a moment to initialize the light source potential start. Okay, so this one is booting now. And we see the light source control on the left hand side, and we also see here. Uh, it has automatically detected the uh, plug-in light source used at the moment. So if I now remove this, this one here, you see it's switching over, okay, it's not detected any light source. I can just put in another one. So you see that's this small LED based um, uh, units not producing uh, too much heat. Um, being completely sine wave modulable. So that's a real big advantage compared to the standard um, xenon based um, systems. And you see it has automatically detected the new light source. So that's a kind of a, a yellow one. And every uh, of these light sources comes with a, a individual factory calibration. So you do not have to bother uh, with doing some calibration on site, you just assemble the optical bench according to the manual and you've got the turnkey solution. Okay, 
So the first, let's switch on the light. So just enter some intensity, switch on the light. And you see it's actively measured back um, to some um, uh, value. And you see I can set any um, arbitrary intensity I like from zero up to the maximum of the light source. So now we are running at about half of the power. And if we look at the light source here, we can see the light beam. And probably, so I hope it's um, perceivable in the video. If I now shade the feedback sensor, uh, you see I was a bit too much. So I triggered the over current protection, but anyway, just reset it. And the beauty of this system is if I now trick the system and shade the feedback sensor, I hope, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, I hope you can see that the intensity is actively regulated and um, we always get the stable and the calibrated intensity regardless of temperature of the LED or regardless um, of aging of the LED. So that's one of the, uh, let's say, um, special features of this SANA CIMPS in comparison to also some competitors products. Okay, let's get back to the um, broad and white LED, which is a useful thing if you do not want to focus on a special uh, wavelength. And of course, we can also switch this, this one on. And now we want to get over to the things you are interested in, which is the sample itself. So um, we've got uh, some dummy cell here. So I will simply place this. I uh, hope, yeah, sorry. Um, I will place this at the uh, um, sample site. So you see that's all well arranged on the uh, optical bench. You get the exact positions in the manual. And I'm now illuminating the sample um, with my white light source. So the first thing we will see, okay, um, is we already got some OCP. If I now switch off the light, you see it's dropping to a very small uh, value, which is caused to ambient light. So normally when doing these experiments, we recommend putting um, the complete optical bench in a kind of light exclusion box to remove ambient light. We've got this nice LED, um, but um, nearly everything does um, just excluding the light. And the first thing we will do is a very um, simple and very common um, measurement in solar cell business, which is this uh, typical IE curve um, determining the maximum power and also the fill factor of the solar cell. So you see, I set up the light source to some intensity. I've seen it's got built up some OCP. Perhaps we get a bit more of intensity. Um, so we see the OCP is increasing. And we can now use this simple push button method here. This um, dot maximum power and fill factor. And as this is a voltage sweep, we are asked to enter some um, sweep rate. For example, let's stick to 50 millivolts um, per second and also specify the sample time for recording this current voltage curve. Okay, that's all. We'll just run the experiment. And um, we see it's starting at the open circuit um, potential and it's now traveling to short circuit. So that's the common technique to do this um, kind of measurement. 
Um, here in the background, you also see this new uh, feature of this fully configurable um, uh, online display. And once the measurement is done, the software automatically calculates all these common key values, the maximum voltage, that's the OCP, the maximum current, that's the one here in short circuit condition. It also um, gives you the maximum power, which is of course neither here at the short circuit nor at the OCP. Uh, but somewhere in between. So for this special demo cell, it's at around 2 point, sorry, 0 0.281, so about here volts. And you see we get this um, maximum power. And it's also calculating this well-known efficiency um, number, this fill factor, and also giving um, already um, first um, quick measurement of the series resistance and the parallel resistance of this special solar cell. So perhaps um, just another comment on this uh, special kind of solar cell. So uh, you see it's um, kind of typical uh, silicon solar cell and in order to get uh, some neat um, uh, response more or less resembling uh, dye sensitized solar cells. We put some uh, components here on the reverse side. Um, so we do not see the pure um, silicon solar cell, but we see this kind of dye sensitized solar cell behavior. That's also the reason why this cell does not perform as well as a typical um, commercial. So focus is a bit struggling, yeah, back again. Um, so that's also the reason um, why we see, okay, we get this quite a poor fill factor and we also get this high series resistance. So that's a very simple uh, technique doing uh, this um, measurement very easy you see it's just one push button you hit it and you get the result very neat very easy to use okay let's get to some more um, configurable um, types of measurements so at the moment we were running at one fixed intensity with, which was pre-selected at 200 watts per square meter. So I have just chosen some arbitrary value. Now we can study the cell behavior under different intensities. And we can use this kind of time domain measurements here. So you see, we've got the button to set up these um, experiments. And that's a very, very versatile tool. So you've got the possibility to either actively polarize the sample, for example, run it um, in short circuit or run it at any DC bias and see the uh, current response. We've got the possibility to just record the voltage. So we are running here in open circuit mode. We are not um, drawing any current out of the sample, but we are just monitoring the OCP. And these two methods, they are combined with this nice feature here. Uh, you can preset arbitrary intensity profiles. So um, you see, you can just click this and I can enter some timestamps. So I can, for whatever, enter 15 seconds, switch the light intensity to whatever, let's say, 90 watts per square meter and after some other time um, let's say 25 seconds for example switch it completely off get another timestamp at let's say 40 seconds switch back on to some other intensity and fully configure my intensity profile here 
course, I can set up the overall measurement time. I can set up the sampling rate. So that's a very um, neat thing to configure the experiment to your special needs. Okay, let's stick with this um, setup here. So I uh, designed it. I'll do some kind of open circuit um, potential measurement for a minute and I'll run this special intensity profile starting at 200 watts per square meter, dropping it to um, 90 watts per square meter after 15 seconds, dropping it further to zero at um, 25 seconds and finally on 40 get back to 120. So once I've set this up, I can simply start the experiment. So we see um, the screen um, dis uh, displaying the uh, OCP. And um, we also see the intensity um, given here. And at 16 um, seconds, we got the first data point with the 90 watt per square meter, we see a drastic change in um, OCP. And when switching off uh, completely, or at least, um, well, that's some ambient light, we see OCP is more or less dropping to zero. Okay, we got in the third phase, we get again some OCP. And we already get some nice information um, on the system behavior under different light intensities and also see the time course. So especially when switching light off, you see this decay um, of um, OCP here. Well, you also see it in the, um, in the online display here. So you see we do not get the same steep uh, change as here when switching between different intensities, but we get this um, slower response when switching it off completely. So that's a very nice tool to study the time domain, to study the steady state um, behavior of your samples. So that's part of this standard CIMPS setup. So um, you see time resolution for this one uh, is um, limited to uh, 4 hertz or 0 0.25 seconds. Of course, you can increase this one, but the minimal resolution, that's this 0 0.25 here. So you see if I enter less, it's telling me, okay, that's beyond the minimum. Later on, we will um, get to the SIMS FIT, the fast intensity transients, where we can even go much um, further in sampling rate. But at the moment, just stick for this standard time domain, which is uh, possible with um, the standard CIMPS um, system. Okay, so that's at the moment all standard DC, all steady state methods. So for the next experiment, I'd like to switch over to this intensity modulated uh, methods. So this IMPS, IMVS, this intensity modulated photocurrent photovoltage spectroscopy. So here we make use of this unique feature of the LED um, as light source because we can really sine wave modulate the light. So you see I've set some DC bias, still the 200 watts per square meter. And if I now access the control of the light source uh, potential start, you see I, I, I've got the DC bias here. So that's some arbitrary uh, voltage. Do not bother about this one. That's given by the factory calibration um, constant, which um, is uh, by coincidence, 200 watts per volt. So you see I've preset 200 watts and I get the 0 0.999 volts. Okay, 
So now we can superimpose some AC amplitude, stick here, just enter whatever, 200 um, millivolts. And um, already in the online display, we see we get this um, sine wave modulated intensity. So it's reading voltage here because that's the control of the light source potential stand. But in fact, the thing we are now modulating, that's light intensity. And if I um, lower the frequency, perhaps lower it to one hertz, okay? Um, and probably perhaps I get a bit more of modulation depth. Um, we can look over to the um, light source and well it's not really good visible in the in the video I think um, but in fact we really get this sine wave modulation on the light intensity and of course this is perfectly controlled by this feedback sensor sitting here beside the cell so the position of this feedback sensor is well thought. On the one hand side, it does not take away any light intensity of the sample. So it's outside our typically illuminated diameter of um, 20 millimeters, but it's still in vicinity of the sample. So um, we are really recording intensity near the sample and not something directly um, in the light source or, the, or after some beam splitter not reflecting the real um, intensity at the sample site. Okay, so we've got this modulated or this sine wave modulated um, light um, talking about amplitude. Um, that's a bit different to the standard EIS, to the standard electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. In standard impedance spectroscopy, you're normally sticking to very low um, AC amplitudes, not to leave the linear regime of the samples. For this one here, we have always to keep in mind, well, these 200 millivolts, that's not the thing the sample is seeing, but that's, um, some uh, value given by this calibration constant. So we can afford running a much higher um, AC modulation depth, getting a better signal to noise ratio. Okay, we've seen we can modulate the light source and now very, very similar, uh, similar to um, EIS, to electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, we can now set up our frequency sweep. So I can give here some upper frequency limit. So let's stick to 10 kilohertz here. I can set my lower frequency limit. So perhaps we speed this up and just go down to one hertz. And you see the software is um, calculating all these values. You can influence them as in standard EIS um, to tweak it exactly to the things you like to, but I'll just stay with the defaults. So we are doing this scan from one kilohertz up to 10 kilohertz and um, get down to one hertz. So that's the thing we want to do um, with our sample here. Um, now I can decide whether either I want to run a IMVS uh, intensity modulated photovoltage spectrum. So at the moment we are running at OCP mode. This would be uh, some kind of IMVS, but I can also run um, IMPS, uh, intensity modulated photo current um, spectrum. For this purpose, um, I can set the DC working point um, of this um, sample of the solar cell to anything I like to. Um, for example, we can stick to the um, short circuit condition. So you see if I switch the potential start on at zero volts, I get this 6.08 milliamps 
So if we remember this measurement here, so at the moment we are running at exactly this DC working point, but we are absolutely free to choose any DC working point here. So we can characterize the system in any state. And that's also one of the beauties of this SANA CIMPS systems. You've got many different um, measurements, but you've got one setup, so you can switch easily back and forth between the measurements and characterize your sample. Okay, so let's, for this demo, do such a photo current, such a IMPS measurement. I've selected some a DC working point, which is short circuit here. And um, before I start, I want to talk a bit about this polarity um, switch here. So that's a, a very special thing of this um, intensity modulated techniques. In standard EIS, you've got some voltage or um, current um, excitation and you are measuring the corresponding um, quantity. So you are presetting, you are exciting voltage, you are measuring the current and vice versa. For the CIMPS, we've got now three quantities, which is light intensity, which is voltage and current. So we can select any two and um, fix a third. And um, in the case of this intensity modulated techniques, um, with no direct um, sign or um, effect, um, well, sign convention or um, some um, common uh, connection between voltage and current, but we can either have the situation um, some intensity increase may either cause a voltage or current increase or decrease. So we can um, switch this over. So we get the minimum phase angle spectra. So for this um, system, we will switch to the P-type. So you see it's labeled um, um, in the kind of um, majority charge carriers of your samples. So um, in this configuration, the demo cell looks like a P-type semiconductor. And if I now start the experiment, so I'll start the CIMPS. So just taking a few seconds to initialize the measurement. We see some um, a plot, which is at the moment the body representation, um, which is very similar to impedance spectroscopy. The only difference is we see the photocurrent here instead of impedance. Okay, so we get our magnitude of the photocurrent in the um, blue data points and we get the magnitude of the phase angle in this um, red data points. Of course, I can use the online display to open up an additional plot um, of the Nyquist representation or any configurable one. So that's a very nice thing. I can watch both at the same time. And if you now look at the um, look at the measured data points, we already see, okay, we get some time dependence. We get some time um, uh, constant here. So it's running into kind of uh, ohmic regime, which means um, phase angle is dropping to around um, zero and uh, we get some fixed value here and getting to higher frequencies, um, we see phase angle increases and we get this drop of um, um, photocurrent response. So 
Um, first thing we can do, we can just look at the two um, representations. We see this neat um, semicircle here, which normally always indicates some kind of RC parallel um, 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 model. That's a very easy technique. Um, we want to proceed a bit further and we really want to model this spectrum now, or at least I'll give a short um, introduction to this. So like um, impedance spectroscopy, um, I will switch now over to our simulation and analysis tool. So you see, I'll tell the system I'll save the, the data. I can get some comment in here, Never mind. I'll just test IMPS, whatever. I'll just give some file name and I'll save the measured data on my disk. And it automatically switches over to my um, simulation tool. So that's one common tool for doing um, standard EIS, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, and also this IMPS, IMVS. So I've got my measured data here. And now I can set up some equivalent model. If I've got some uh, standard situation, I can also just load some uh, pre-saved model and skip all this model generation. But I want to get into this kind of creating and building up my own model. So I just select new model, well, just give it some name. So I just start with a blank new model and I've got all these circuit elements you are typically using for uh, both impedance spectroscopy and uh, for uh, IMPS, IMVS. I've got simple resistors, I've got um, coil seductive elements, I've got um, electrostatic capacitors, so that's um, ideal capacitor. I've got this special electrochemistry circuit element like the constant phase. I've got um, special um, circuit elements resembling porous electrodes. So that's a very versatile tool. Well, for this uh, demo, we will start with a very simplistic uh, model. We'll keep it simple. So probably I'll start with such a kind of a, a resistor parallel to some capacitor. And um, in order to set this up, I um, can um, simply select some um, circuit element, or I can tell the system, okay, uh, later on I'll need some starting value. And probably the starting value has to be um, resembled uh, by the uh, spectrum later on. So I get this preview of the spectrum and now I know, okay, I'd like to start with a simple resistor. And I know um, resistors will dominate the spectrum whenever I'm uh, near a phase angle of zero degrees. So probably I'll be somewhere here in the low frequency region. So let's just select this point here and I select the resistance and you see it's already coming up with a um, first um, guess with an initial value we can use as a starting value for our non-linear fit. So I take over the um, calculated value and I will start a new partial scheme. So at the moment we see, okay, we've got only one resistor so of course, uh, the diagram, that's a very um, simple one. And um, of course, we can change the value to any other. Um, and we see, well, it's just changing. Now add a second one, add this capacitor. And of course, um, the capacitive part of the spectrum is somewhere with the phase angle near minus 90 degrees, so we are somewhere up here. Let's get this point. I'll get the capacitor. I'll get already 
some um, starting value and I will connect this in parallel to my first resistor. So I can already look at this. Well, okay, um, that's looking um, this way here. I can tweak the values and, um, sorry, uh, okay. And I can display the change of the diagram. And once I'm fine with this uh, first idea, I can now tell the system, okay, I've got my model, I've got my measured data, please um, try to fit the parameters here uh, to the real measured data. And you see that was a, pr a process of around a second. Um, we see that's definitely not a perfect model, but if we just look how um, it is um, looking like, we see, well, okay, it's working quite, quite well in the intermediate range. We should do um, some optimization here. But anyway, we got a first um, set of parameters here. Um, we also see um, the fitter gives me some hint on the significance which is the importance of the circuit element um, for this um, um, spectrum. And it gives also some kind of fitting error. So you see uh, here, well, um, it's not perfectly matching. We should um, tweak the model. We should tune the model to get a better fit. Um, but anyway, we've got the first idea and a very nice feature which is also unique to SANA um, fitting, is this significance plot. So you see the equivalent circuit here with the uh, resistor given in one and the capacitor given uh, as number two. And you see a plot which defines which part of the spectrum is dominated by which circuit element. So, um, We've got the resistor here in the low frequency part dominating. We've got the capacitor dominating in the high frequency part. So that's a very nice and a really powerful tool to analyze um, your IMPS, IMVS spectra. So I hope this was a very short introduction into SIM. We could spend hours on talking how to tweak your model and how to get results out of it. But I think we'll just get um, back to um, our photoelectrochemistry uh, demonstration. So um, we've been uh, running this um, IMPS. We could have also done um, IMVS, photovoltaic spectrum. Well. I think we can just um, skip this one and have a look um, at one, let's say, um, more or less complementary method, um, which is this um, charge extraction. So um, up to now, we've been running um, some uh, sine wave modulated intensity to get some idea of the kinetics of the uh, sample of the solid cell. This time we will use some kind of um, transient um, measurement. So uh, that's a thing published by um, Lori Peter. Um, so um, that's a well-known technique. So the idea is you illuminate the sample with some uh, given intensity. And um, you are doing this for some time to get the system into equilibrium, to get everything in steady state. And after this time, the uh, measurement system will switch off the light. And of course, um, the voltage of the cell will slowly decay. So um, internal recombination, um, internal um, uh, 
processes will use up this remaining charge generated um, before and after um, some additional time we will remove all remaining charge in the cell. So we will um, discharge the cell, we will switch on the potential start again and see um, how much of the charge remains within the sample. So we've seen before it was around six milliamps of short uh, circuit current, so probably I'll stick to something in the range of 10 milliamps. We will not bother about the times, but we can perhaps this, uh, shorten this a bit. And we'll just start this experiment by clicking the start button. And we see um, at the beginning we've got a 200 watts per uh, square uh, meter. Once we switch off the light at two seconds, we see this decay in um, voltage in open circuit potential. And at three seconds, so remember that was two plus one, um, we are now um, getting all the residual charge out of the cell. So you see we get this um, current spike and um, that's integrated uh, and we get um, the net charge remaining in this, uh, in this sample. So we can run this experiment um, at different light off times. So just stick to two. So you see it's decaying further and we see we get a different um, shape of the, um, of the resulting uh, peak here. We could um, of course now um, get the exact data, export it, save it and analyze it for further um, uh, evaluation. I will just um, skip this. I'm just looking at this quantitatively. So we see that's a possibility to characterize this decay, to characterize the amount of charge remaining after some time. So this time domain measured, that's something complementary uh, to this small uh, excitation um, sinusoidal technique. Okay. So that's a very short uh, introduction into this charge extraction. This was our first um, transient method. And when talking about the time domain, I was already talking about this um, option for fast intensity transients, this CIMPS fit technique. And that's the next method I want to present. So up to now, we were just using this standard CIMPS, uh, CIMVS core system. Now we will, will make use of one of the option. So um, you see it's uh, giving here, it's requiring the CIMPS system, the one we've been using before, and the fit package with the transient recorder. And I've got the system here. Um, so you see um, within um, the Senium, we have got this um, transient recorder plugin with um, the trigger cable here connected to the light source. Um, so that's giving the trigger signal to record the data. And that's one of the options of this CIMPS system. So um, if you're interested in fast intensity transients, just get this fit add-on and we'll see, I'll start it up. You remember with the standard CIMPS, we were uh, limited to a minimum uh, sampling time of 0 0.25 seconds. Now with this um, transient recorder, we can now 
uh, you see I can set um, the time resolution here. We can go down to 50 nanoseconds equaling um, sampling rate of 20 megahertz. But of course we can also set any value um, um, we like here. Okay, so um, you see the screen is quite similar to the CIMPS system. We've got the source control. I still have preset my 200 watts per square meter. I've still got my cell control. So I can both do either voltage transients or current transients. So at the moment you see it's running in OCP mode. Um, I'll do some kind of um, voltage transient. And I know probably I'll spend a bit more time than the 10 milliseconds, um, for example, to a recording time of a second. And we can just start the measurement. So you see uh, it's preset to switch off the light source after the settling time of two seconds. And we will record the voltage response to uh, one further seconds. So let's just start it. Okay, we'll stick to 200 watts per second. So it's doing uh, the measurement. And well, I'll just zoom in here. And you see the green curve. That's the, the voltage, the red one, that's the intensity. So the green curve, when we switch off the intensity, we see the decay of the voltage. So we see exactly the same as we've seen before in the uh, charge extraction or the exactly same we've seen in CIMPS time domain methods. The beauty of this one uh, is, you see, we've got this nice time resolution. I can now really zoom in here and um, analyze this data down to the micro or even nanosecond range. Okay, so that's um, fast intensity transients. We could just switch over to uh, current transient. So I switch on the potential start. I'll just get some arbitrary value. Let's stick to um, short circuits. Probably um, get a bit more of um, um, time resolution and short measurement time a bit. And let's have a look at the current transient. So we see, okay, in this time, um, we've got the current as the red curve. And if we, well, I should have even shortened this a bit. Um, we see when switching off the light instantly, uh, we get this decay in, cur uh, in current. So that's a very handy thing, um, not only to use the small signal sinusoidal um, um, techniques as in the CIMPS, CIMVS uh, of the base package, um, but also um, do this transient um, methods. Okay, another method I want to um, demonstrate here, that's um, shock light uh, voltammetry. So up to now, every time um, we were talking about um, setting DC working point, I was just selecting something. Um, we also remember I um, had done this um, current voltage curve here. And a very neat function without changing the setup. So you see, I never touched the sample. I always just switch between the methods. So that's the beauty of this uh, CIMPS setup. 
So without changing the setup, I can switch over to this chopped light voltammetry. That's again a method which can be do, done with the core CIMPS system, so no option required. And again, we see this common um, layout of the user interface. We've got our source control. We've got our cell control here. And now the idea is I want to see which um, voltage range is showing um, photo current um, response. So um, typically, um, especially uh, alternative solar cell concepts, they show some significant dark current. I'm probably not interested uh, for the photoelectrochemical measurements in this dark current, but I really want to see the photocurrent response, the one generated by light. And uh, we will again do a simple voltage sweep. So for example, um, I can start from, let's say, zero short um, circuit, and I can measure up, I, um, I can measure up um, whatever, um, to um, 0 0.5 volt or 0 0.4 volt and just um, see um, what's happening when I'm switching light on and off um, constantly. So that's the idea of this chopped light. So you chop the light intensity, you switch on and off, and we will monitor the a uh, voltage sweep between 0 and 0 0.4 volts. Okay, just, just start this thing here. So in the um, sketch, you see there's this dark uh, and this yellowish basis. And if you look over um, to the cell side, we see the light being switched on and off. And near the um, short circuit, near the zero volts, um, we do not see um, 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 uh, some slope. We are getting here um, to the, so it's um, done now. Um, so we see we've got the maximum um, change between the dark, or perhaps, perhaps I just speed this up a bit. Let's say, for example, I, let's do 20, okay, that's fine. So we can uh, more clearly see the difference between the dark faces and you see the yellowish one, the bright faces. So we've got a significant change in the dark. We got nearly no uh, current overall. And in the bright phases, we get this high current. So we can easily distinguish uh, between uh, the dark current and the photo current. And perhaps if we just get over to 0 0.5, just um, trying again. So I just modified the parameters um, to um, get over the OCP of the um, silicon solar cell. So already we see um, there's some slope um, in the measurement. And once we are passing the um, 0 0.5, Four, five, whatever we see, the difference between the dark faces here and the bright faces is getting smaller and smaller. So photocurrent response is also getting smaller and smaller. Okay, so that's another nice um, technique, getting the correct um, DC working point for measuring photocurrent. And uh, for the final um, of my um, presentation, I would now uh, like to switch over uh, from this um, 
either monochromatic um, light sources or these white light sources um, to this kind of, uh, I think, well, illumination is somewhat bad here, but anyway, to this um, special tunable light source. So I will just um, have a look. Oh, that's a bit, a bit tricky here. I will just um, rearrange um, the, the setup. So I will switch off this one here. Okay. I will um, just disconnect this one. I'll remove the sample from this optical bench and um, I'll put the monochromatic beside and get the, the tunable one. So you see that's a very small, um, very handy instrument, uh, much smaller than uh, the typical um, Xenon arc lamp based ones and um, due to the fact we are using LED technique in this tunable light source also, we get also a very efficient light source. So we do not have to spend 100 or 500 watts of electric power to just get some milliwatts or microwatts of light intensity, but using this LED technology, um, we get a very bright, um, tunable light source without thermal burden, uh, burden without um, having all the hassle of some kind of arc lamp. So you see that's a very um, handy tool. I'll just remove the protective cap. So we've got here the uh, end of the light guide. So that's where uh, of this fully unitized light source light um, illuminates the sample. And the first thing I'll do now is um, start up this, sorry, um, start up um, this um, IPCE QE technique. So um, uh, you hear the stepper motors of the uh, LED array. So we've got a complete array of LEDs inside this unit and also the um, stepper motors driving the monochromator back and forth. And you see again, that's a very uh, similar kind of screen. We did not um, change too much um, on the uh, setup. Perhaps we will just switch off the sample anyway. Um, and we see we've got source control here. But now uh, we can use the source control to use any of these installed LEDs. So you see that um, around 25 discrete wavelengths we can do even without the monochromator. You also see here in the third column, we've got um, considerable high uh, intensities. So that's compared to this typical um, Xenon arc lamp monochromator based one, um, very uh, bright, a very efficient light source. And we see we've got a really large wavelength range. So in the very near infrared, we are here around um, 1000, 1020 nanometers. And for the standard version of this um, tunable light source, we get down to 365, 369 nanometers, which is already um, in the UV range, of course, we've got the complete visible range. And as an option, uh, we can extend this down to even um, 290, 295 nanometers. So this extension is especially interesting if you're working with bare titanium dioxide, 
which is typically absorbing in the area of 300 nanometers. So getting this UV extension enables you to do studies on bare titanium dioxide samples. Okay, so we can select any wavelength here. We can just switch it on to some intensity. And if we have a look, if we've got a look at the um, light guide, so we see we are at um, 505, so that's this kind of um, uh, green uh, light. And, um, uh, sorry, wrong button. Um, if I now select some other, for example, go down to 430, you see it's switching over to um, blue light. And um, so we can use this unit to study the wavelength um, response, uh, the wavelength resolved photocurrent um, response. Okay, I'll um, just um, get the sample back into the light beam. Just put it in front of the light guide. Yeah, and we already see, okay, we got some OCP. And um, now, um, as in the IMPS measurement, I um, can select again any DC bias. So I can run this at uh, short circuit conditions. I can run this at uh, any um, maximum power point, whatever. For this example, just stick to the um, short circuit conditions. And um, for the IPC measurement, um, we will run again some um, AC measurement, again, separating the dark current from the photocurrent response. But this time we will not vary the frequency of the intensity modulation. This was the thing we were doing in the CIMPS, CIMVS technique. This time um, we are interested in optical wavelength. So I can preset some um, range of optical wavelength, whatever, 360, 2020. And the system will automatically uh, switch between the different wavelengths and do this photocurrent measurement uh, at this given DC working point. Okay, so let's simply start the measurement. Again, you see it's looking a bit like um, IMPS, IMVS, or even like EIS. Um, but this time, the interesting thing is the wavelength here. So that's our varied quantity. Okay, uh, so at first it's initializing the positions of both of the LED array and the uh, monochromator. At the moment we are running in this mode where we only use the um, dedicated LEDs without fine tuning them with the monochromator. Okay. So you hear the system is um, just ranging to get the perfect uh, measurement range for the first data point. And we see it's doing this AC type of measurement, this um, single frequency intensity modulated photocurrent um, measurement at the 77 hertz, which was 
but the preset, ah, yeah, <laughs> and I see I just have forgotten probably to switch over um, polarity, so probably we have to do um, this here, okay. Sorry. So this was the uh, thing I was talking about at the um, CIMPS screen um, with the uh, change of intensity um, not directly being covered to the uh, change of current or voltage in a fixed um, um, sign. Okay. So it just takes a bit time to um, initialize. Okay, only takes a few seconds and now we get uh, still. Well, anyway, should have should have changed anyway. I'll just just um, keep it running. Um, so we see we've got the intensity uh, modulated excitation. We've got the current response, and now we see um, wavelength is changing. So um, we were starting at three sixty five. It's going up to four thirty. We are now in the blue. And we already see uh, the base system of this dummy cell that some kind of uh, silicon um, uh, solar cell. So we get this increase in photocurrent um, response once um, we increase in uh, wavelength. So now we are getting near the um, red. Um, region here. So still we get this um, increase in um, photocurrent efficiency in IPC. Okay, so 701, so that's getting uh, really red now. And um, 765, so that's already beyond the thing, uh, beyond the wavelength range, uh, you can see with your eyes. So that's uh, already very near infrared. And um, for this special sample, for this um, solid state silicon solar cell, we clearly see, okay, we've got some maximum of IPCE of photocurrent response around 800, whatever, 25. And we see it's dropping here. So um, getting to the infrared, getting to the less um, um, energy rich photons in this area, also efficiency um, is dropping. So that's a really um, handy tool for analyzing um, solar cell concepts, for analyzing. Um, the wavelength dependence of photocurrent generation because the better you are using the uh, solar spectrum, the higher your overall uh, efficiency, which was measured in this um, maximum power fill factor measurement will be. Of course, um, we again have got some neat analysis tools, so I just save this again, IPCE, whatever. So you see you've got this analysis tool. I can switch from photocurrent representation over to IPCE. So you see it's now at uh, this uh, dimensionless scale from zero to one. Well, I can also switch this to give it in percent, whatever. And I can so, um, easily get the wavelength uh, dependence of the IPC.
So that's also one of the core technologies, uh, measurement types you're doing in solar cell research. So that's giving the um, wavelength dependence. And we remember we were doing um, with the classic CIMPS setup, but that's also possible with the tunable one. We were doing all this intensity um, and frequency related um, measurement. So that's the beauty of this uh, SANA CIMPS product range. Uh, you've got a large variety of different methods. You can study every single aspect of your photoelectrochemical system and get deep insights in your sample. Okay, so I think um, that was the time we um, scheduled for this short demonstration of the CIMPS system. I hope it um, gave a nice overview on all the possibilities. I skipped some of the options here of the um, emission measurement, optical absorbance, um, optical impedance spectroscopy, but focused on the most important ones for solar cell research. Okay, so thanks for your attention. I hope you have enjoyed this. Thank you. Well, um, we really appreciate that comprehensive overview of all the different tools. A lot of information for everyone to ponder over, no doubt. Um, so, how do I switch back to, because I just wanted to. If Michael could either yeah. stop sharing. Or... Okay, so Michael, uh, if you could stay in the line, please, because we do have just a few minutes. Uh, we're, we're doing quite well on time. We have about five minutes for any questions from anyone that might be in the audience here at ASU. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So we'll go back to this. There we go. Um, so yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So we had a chance to review <clears throat> those various measurements. Uh, hopefully, uh, right, everyone who's out here and anyone that, that views this webinar might view it in, in the future after we post the recording. Um, we're happy to you know answer any questions that you have right now about anything that Michael showed, or to answer anything in general. Uh, Admin Instruments is based here in Phoenix, so you know we're, we can use those resources at any time for anyone in the crowd here, and we're of course happy to travel anywhere uh, for any of the other uh, Quest-based universities. Uh, this is our contact information on the screen. Uh, you can reach out to me or Michael. We um, communicate uh, quite a bit uh, between the two of us anyway. Uh, so yes, uh, all of them is one for questions. Is there anything that uh, for Michael or myself that you'd like to uh, expand on anymore? Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm Michael from Seth here at ASU. Um, sorry for being late, so maybe you have covered it in the beginning. Um, I'm wondering what is the really special thing? I see that the software it can do a lot of things with the same tool, but so the examples that you have shown are I would say easy cases. So you don't go to extreme wavelengths, you don't go to extreme um, frequencies. So it's relatively standard thing. So what can a tool do in terms of technical specs that others cannot? Okay. Uh, so okay. Okay, I'll let Michael answer that and I'll fill in any gaps that there might be. So Michael. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry, I did not get. Uh, everything of the um, um, question because the audio was a bit um, um, quiet. But anyway, I think it was the question, what specific advantages has the SANA uh, CIMPS set up uh, to competitor solution? Is this correct? Uh, that's correct. In, in, in addition to that, you know, considering some of the more extreme cases of, uh, of uh, high, very high or very low wavelength light sources or uh, you know, what sort of thing. Oh, okay. Cell um, doesn't have an infrared option because the quantum efficiency of a silicon cell does not seem to be covered from the wavelength. Did you hear that, Mike? Uh, sorry, I did not get the last one. I'm very sorry. 
talking about like infrared rays. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, or the the frequency range um, for the frequency dependent measurement. How how far up can you go? Okay, so the standard CIMPS system that's specified to go up to 100 um, kilohertz. And uh, you can um, do this transient measurements uh, I've shown in the fit um, up to a time resolution of um, 20 um, megahertz or uh, 50 nanoseconds. So for the sine wave, for the small signal uh, sine wave excitation, we specify the overall system on 100 kilohertz. And for the transients, um, it's 20 megahertz. Okay, thank you. So what do you think would be the, the really thing that makes it unique, apart from the fact that it's one instrument for many different purposes? Okay, um, so we were talking about wavelength range. Um, we were not talking about intensity. So definitely with much higher intensities of the light sources, both the plug-in and also the tunable light sources, the typical uh, competitor systems, and especially taking into account this tunable light source, um, that's higher intensity than the large xenon lamp monochromator based ones. And um, as it's not running on this arc lamp type, it's also higher lifetime, instant switch on, so there's no warm up time. Um, and um, in addition to the higher lifetime, you're not obliged to uh, change um, the xenon lamps frequently, so that's typically 1000 hours or whatever, because even in case some lead is degrading or even failing, there's no catastrophic failure. So that's uh, very safe, very energy efficient, and also um, very quick thing to turn on. So that's the beauty. Um, you've got prepared your sample, you just put it into the uh, sample holder, you just switch on the light source and you can measure immediately. So that's also quite time saving. So we've got high, intensity, both uh, of the plug-in and the um, tunable light source. We've got the broadest variety on um, options. So you've seen um, we've got not only the standard ones, but we've got optical impedance spectroscopy. I did not demonstrate this one here. We've got the combination with um, optical absorbance spectroscopy. We've got the option for optical emission uh, measurement. So that's the broadest range of options, the most versatile uh, system for photoelectrochemistry on the market. So you said high intensity, how high can you go? How many suns do you reach? So the uh, LSW2, um, that's running at um, one sun. Uh, it's not an AM 1.5 spectrum. Um, um, it's, um, um, let's say, a um, somewhat different one, but we um, normally get above one sun for the um, white one, and we get near one sun um, for the blue one. I think that's the 470 or the 450 one. And um, we are getting in the range of, let's say, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 suns for uh, most of the monochromatic light sources. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Very good question. Um, are there any additional questions from anyone else uh, among us here today? What are the sample size that you can? Okay, so sample size. Use? Okay, sample size. Um, so, um, with the standard plug-in light sources, uh, we've got more or less a, a maximum sample size of 20 millimeters in diameter. So, um, that's adapted to our PECC, our photoelectrochemical uh, cell. So, um, we've got this area of um, um, 
homogeneous um, light on 20 millimeters of diameter for the plug-in light sources. And um, for the tunable, you've seen uh, this uh, light guide before. Uh, it's a bit smaller, um, that's running at um, one centimeter. minute webinar so we've kept our promise there um, all right so Michael I think that does it for all the questions uh, with our uh, crowd here at ASU so again thank you very much for uh, giving a, the comprehensive overview of all the different uh, functionality for the synth system and uh, yes uh, you know we'll be sure, uh, sure to post this online later on and make sure that you'll have a chance to link to it to be able to Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Bye. Okay, take care. Bye. -bye. Thank you. So we'll just end the webinar now. Uh, yeah, I did have another question as well. Um, so okay. In order to uh, put feedback relayed to giving the accurate calibration, do you also have to keep your sample at a fixed distance uh, from, from the light source? Yeah, so Michael, you're still there, right? So uh, the question is about keeping this, the, the distance between the light source and the sample, keeping that fixed versus having it be variable. Um, so the system comes with um, factory calibration of for the plug-in light source uh, of 10 uh, centimeters. Um, but of course, you are free to vary this somewhat. Um, in this case, if you vary the distance between the light source and the sample, um, we recommend either to have a separate uh, factory calibration on this, but we've got also an easy push button method. If you get a dedicated calibration sensor, we've got an easy push button method to recalibrate the light source uh, to some um, variable distance. Of course, there's limits. Uh, you cannot extend it to three meters or whatever, um, but a few uh, centimeters difference from the nominal 10 um, centimeters is possible. And there's a very easy procedure for uh, recalibrating uh, the system for this distance. Okay, thank you. Great. All right, any, any more last minute questions? Again, we, you know, we'll let uh, be sure if there's anything comes up after we can uh, get Michael involved as needed. Okay, Michael, that'll be all. Thanks again. Have a very good evening. Thanks for staying up uh, at the office late for us. Appreciate it. Okay. okay. So thank you very much for this webinar. Goodbye.